Welcome back. How is the accuracy of your rifle? You know, everybody can tell exactly what's going on with their rifle if they know how to read their targets. You can read your target like a book. It'll tell you, it'll tell you everything if you know exactly what you're looking at. Don't just walk up to a target like I see so many people doing. They just walk up to their target and they look and they say, well, it's not very accurate, you know, and they go home disgusted or they, they just tear it off and, and it's just another day. They're not learning what the target is trying to tell them because the target, the information that's contained on those, by those bullet holes on the, on the paper tells it all. Um, I want to get nomencla nomenclature straight here. Rifles shoot groups. Shotguns shoot patterns. <laughs> please don't, please don't be writing, uh, you know, about how your how your rifle patterns. We don't we don't pattern with rifles, not unless you're drawing unless you're drawing faces or something on a target because you're a marksman. That's a pattern. Rifles group shotguns pattern. Okay. Um, and how they group is exactly what we're going to be talking about today. The very first thing I want to talk about, and I'm going to open up a can of worms here. I've, I've talked about this before in separate videos. Um, but start out, with a, start out with a rifle that treats you right. Um, and when I say that, make sure you start out with a rifle which is properly bedded. How is a rifle properly bedded? Well, it's not the old way. Um, and I know I'll get a lot of grumbling with people who say, well, I got my old model, my old model 70, my old model 700, I got my old Savage. They weren't free floated. They, they shoot great. Well, they'd shoot better if they were free floated and glass bedded, guaranteed. Um, that's, that's, become, that's become very, very well known throughout the shooting world uh, that if a barrel vibrates, if it's allowed to vibrate uh, without impinging on the stock, without colliding with the stock, or without any pressure from the stock, uh, it's going to shoot better. And if the receiver is solidly bedded so that it can't move, it's going to shoot better. Those are the two essentials. You've got to have a solidly bedded receiver and you've got to have a free flow to stock, period. I, I, that's the end of the discussion. I know that that's not an opinion factor. That's that's. Uh, that's an industry known fact. That's why all your your most accurate rifles, like your Tikas, the, these here, these Model 70 made by FN, your Brownings, they all have something in common. Uh, they're all free floated, and they all have very very solid bedding. That's just the way it goes. Uh, so uh, my hats off to the people who made rifles in the past. You know, back in uh, 25, 30 years ago. They did what they knew was best for the day, you know, but like everything else, things improve. And I don't want to hear people say that, you know, rifles were better than they did not. I've, I owned barrels. I owned rifles back then, and I've owned rifles now. And I had to work a lot by modifying those old rifles in order to get them to shoot. I had to free float them, and I had to glass bed them in order to get them to perform. That's just simply the way it is. So... What are we going to, oh, and before I get off that topic, let's talk a little bit about that bedding issue. Um, you know, and I've mentioned this before, your, your bedding system should be ideally a, a two-point bedding system. I know that you can have a, a solidly bedded receiver all the way from, you know, front to stern. It, you can do that. Uh, but, you know, if you've got, if you've got a, if you've got a rifle that's two-point bedded, you're going to have a better chance of not having any uh, any problems with sponginess with one of your action screws because maybe the wood is crowned in the middle. Um, that can happen just simply because any number of reasons. Uh, you know, you can have wood that tends to move through the years. Uh, you can have e even even plastic can change through the years. Uh, anything like that. Uh, two points. A two-point bedding system is like two cross bucks that, you know, a sawyer will put a log on and he'll saw. That, that log's not going to go anywhere because it's sitting on two cross bucks. He doesn't put it on three cross bucks because it's going to bobble around is the, because the log has got, you know, it's, got, it's, got, it's not straight, it's curved. So even if, he puts, even if he puts all three cross bucks at the same place, that log is going to shift around. Two is all he has. Two, a two-point bedding system uh, for sawing wood and a two-point bedding system for, for uh, bedding your rifle and you, you're going to have a good situation. 
You can tell if you've got sponginess by the way the screws go in. When you wind those screws in, you'll feel the, co the first contact of that where the, the screw head uh, is hitting the steel, the, the trigger guard here, uh, or, the, or the front, and once it hits, you shouldn't turn more than three hours on the clock, you know, from zero to 90 degrees. That's all you should be turning. You, should, you shouldn't be squishing down. You shouldn't, you shouldn't feel, if you put your fingers, you know, at this point up here, you shouldn't feel that wood progressively getting closer and closer and closer to the metal as you tighten it down. That is, that is a very bad situation that will cause all kinds of headaches. So now let's go on to reading. And, and stay, away from, stay away from oiling your rifle because oiling your rifle is going to cause all kinds of headaches with uh, accuracy as the wood gets punky. So what I've got here are some different, uh, different targets that I, that I made up. I, I shot my, uh, I shot my uh, pellet rifle through them to, to make up some marked targets. And these, we'll, we'll say that these targets are full size full-size cider targets. This is just to scale so I don't have to be handling a big target. Um, so what you see here is to scale uh, maybe three to one. So everything that you see here is something which uh, would be much more exaggerated on paper um, by, a, by a factor of say three. Well here's one here. This is, this is shots are just everywhere. They may, some of them may not even be on the paper. Probably they won't be on the paper. They're just everywhere. There's no, there's no consistency whatsoever. This truly is a shotgun pattern. I mean, this is, uh, this is, has nothing to do with rifles whatsoever. But you're getting this. And the reason you're getting this is because you've got a loose sight. Um, whether your scope is loose or your front sight or your rear sight on an iron sight or gun is loose, something is loose. With a scope, it not only can be external, it can not only be the, the, the mounts themselves, which are loose, uh, but it certainly can be the internal reticle system. In other words, how, how those crosshairs are, are positioned. If those, if those aren't nailed down in place, if you've got, if you've got a loose mechanism inside that's causing, that's causing the lenses to move around or the, uh, or the uh, crosshairs to move around, whatever it is, something's not tight. So when you see that, Assess your sights and uh, make sure everything is tight. And I'm not talking about torquing. You know, you don't have to. It, it requires no severe torquing for for a uh, that scope. That scope right there is is simply screwed on by by a regular screwdriver by hand pressure and the uh, the screw the the torques the torque screws uh, are simply a little Allen wrench. And when the Allen wrench starts to bend, that's it. You're all done. That's why you don't need to have a torque. You don't have to have a, a, a torque wrench in order to measure your uh, torque setting on, on screws. Loophole gives you that little wrench for a reason because they know that that's, that's si sized and scaled such that when you're turning those, when you're turning those torque screws and that, and that wrench starts to bend, and hurt your finger. That's the end of it. That you you've got plenty of you've got plenty of tightness. So don't put away your, you know put away your wallet and don't be going out buying torque wrenches. You don't need that torque wrenches. So that's that's bad. That's bad. Um, bad sights. See if I can get more organized here. Next one now, we've got. And again, these are scaled. These shots are walking across the target, left to right. Um, it's, it's strictly a horizontal situation. Vertical dispersion is very, very small. Uh, we have vertical dispersion, which may only be, you know, one inch, uh, but the horizontal dispersion could be three or three or four inches, left to right. That's altogether wind. That's that's windage. That's exactly what it is. Uh, you've got a you you've got a breeze blowing, which is the, simply pushing pushing those bullets, carrying those bullets across across the sky. Um, bullets, as I've mentioned before in a different video, bullets do not blow off course; they are carried off course because they're they're in a current of wind, and as the wind goes down as the wind goes down the stream, the bullets follow along with it. The same as a the same as a canoe going down a river. 
it follows the current. It's not being blown off course, it's following along the current. And it's so wind, wind uh, currents, you know, every, every wind follows a current, whether it's on a large scale, you know, on the U.S. map or whatever it is. But that's what your bullet is doing on a small scale from 100, at 100 yards, is your, your bullet is simply riding along that wind current. So when you see, when you see vertical dispersion, which is uh, by its nature, not very, not very much, but your horizontal dispersion is a lot. That's all windage. Uh, let's see. Look at this target now. You got five shots. Uh, they're all in one. They're all in one spot. That could be a half inch group. It could be a quarter inch group. That could be a one and a half inch group. That's a great. That's a great group. No matter what. No matter what it is. That's that's a group. That's a group that uh, means that. Everything's tuned in. Your your rifle's tuned in. Uh, your your load is tuned in. Your scope is nice and tight. The only problem is is that uh, you're not you're not zeroed in. That's all. Uh, know how to zero in your know how to zero in your uh, load and uh, situate it. That's all. And don't expect don't expect that because your rifle is sighted in for for a particular load that is going to be sighted in for all loads because it's not going to be the case in most in, in most situations. Most rifles are very sensitive to load variations and changing from changing from one brand of uh, ammo to another or changing from one load to another. Certainly by changing bullet weights, bullet weights will typically mean as the bullet gets heavier, it gets slower and as they get lighter, they get faster. Faster bullets will shoot flatter, and flatter means higher on the paper. So, typically speaking, so this is this is a this is a great group. It just means you need to be sighted in. What we've got going on here, we've got three shots in one spot, and we've got two shots in another. What does that mean? Well, this is you know this is this is a, to scale. This would be maybe a, a, a six inch a six inch spread on the paper. In other words, six inches from here to here instead of two inches. Um, that's all about you. That's, this has nothing to do with the rifle. This is a rifle that's shooting very accurately. You, you, you're never going to have, you're never going to have bedding issues where you're going to have three shots together in one tight cluster and you're going to have two shots together in another, another tight cluster. This is when you, when you got up and you know, went out, went out and used the green room out there and then came back to the bench and you sat down again and you sat down in a different way. Or this is when you uh, positioned your, your rifle stock so that your first, your first shot was lying on the, your first shots were lying here on this uh, sandbag here and then the next time you were situated so your sandbag was back here. Remain consistent and always and always shoot the same way. Um, I'll talk about I'll talk a little bit about uh, how barrels work, and I've mentioned this before. There are two types of vibrations in a rifle barrel. It's primary and secondary. Now that does not mean that they occur at different times. The primary does not occur before the secondary. They're just they're, they're just a descriptor of what the vibrations are. Primary vibrations occur from the primary vibrations occur from back here at this right where it's screwed into the uh, receiver. The barrel is flexing the whole way left, right. It it can be fl flexing in different in different directions, but it's swinging off of this off of this hinge right here where it's attached to the receiver. That's your primary vibration. Um, and your secondary vibration is more like, more like a wave that goes through the barrel. And it, if you if you can imagine, you know, when you when you're straightening out a hose on the driveway, you know, you you, you give it a slap and it and it rides down its length. Or if you got a, a fly line, you do the same thing. You know, you you watch you you watch that fly line and it curves all the way down until it gets to the fly. That's the way a secondary uh, vibration occurs, and those are called nodes and overtones. They have they have great influence on the movement of a bullet. Uh, both both of those vibrations occurring at the same time. They they both occur at the same time as the, as as the 
rifle barrel is flexing up or flexing down, it's also vibrating along its length. So they occur at the same time. And uh, the timing of those vibrations has much to do with the velocity of your load. Um, it, can be, it can be a very subtle thing. Um, loads change from one, you know, from one increment to another, so that's why you need to work up incremental loads. Starting from uh, low to high, work, work up gradually, incrementally according to the capacity of your uh, case. Uh, a, 60, a 60 grain capacity case you'd work up in six tenths of a grain increments. A 50 grain case you'd work up in increments of a half a grain per, per case and so forth all the way down. You just move the decimal point over two points and so if you've got a 20, if you've got a 20 grain case then work up in two, in two tenths of a grain increments and that's the way it goes because uh, that's proportional to the size of your case. If you're, if you're working up in, small, in smaller increments than that, you're wasting your time because there's not going to be the, that, that kind of influence. And if you're working in too large an increment, uh, if for instance you're using half grain increments uh, for a 20 grain case, you can, be, you, know, you can be leapfrogging across every good load. Um, and there's more than one good load uh, in, a, in, a set of, in a set of incremental tests. You'll observe that oftentimes your groups will, your groups will tend to breathe on the target. You have a large group, then you have the next increment will be a smaller group. And then maybe a couple more and they'll be a little bit larger and then a couple more and it'll be a little bit smaller. So, uh, and, and that, that, can occur, that, that can occur in a very, very regular way with, with certain powders, such as extruded powders, you know, single base uh, powders, and it can occur very erratically with uh, double base uh, ball powders, spherical powders, because spherical powders tend to be a lot more fussy. Um, but uh, you'll, have, you'll have that tendency to have, in, in, a, in a, say, an incremental test that involves uh, five or seven different loads. You might have one that you started out with that's really good. Uh, maybe the third one that you try is a very good one. And then the very last one you try is an extremely good one. And that's simply because uh, the vibrations tend to match the velocity of, of the load. Um, and don't be, you know, some, people place too much stock, I think, in reading chronograph information. It's, it's very helpful to know that, uh, you know, loads have a better uh, standard deviation than another load. That can be somewhat helpful. Obviously, if you have gross, if you have gross variations in your standard deviation or if you have uh, gross, you know, extreme spread, if you have one, you know, if you have one load that uh, tends to shoot it from anywhere from 20, 2750 feet per second to 2980 or something like that. That's, that's a grossly inaccurate uh, load that's, that's not suited for uh, accuracy. But when, you get it, when you're getting into you know, the finer details, when you, have, when you have a load which tends to have an you know, extreme spread of only you know, 15 or 20 feet per second, but you have another one that's an extreme spread of 30 feet per second, don't discount the 30 foot per second one because the vibrations might be on tune with your barrel. In other words, you, you might have, you might have uh, maybe not the, best, not the best standard deviation of the lot, but you very well could have the one that your barrel prefers over the other one. And that, that slight variation in velocity is not going to be anywhere near as meaningful as the tuning the, the load to your vibrations of your barrel, the, the nodes and overtones. So don't get those issues confused. You know, you can use it as a guideline to, to, to weed out the really bad stuff. But when you start getting into the more detailed, when, you, when they start to get into generally uh, good loads, don't, don't throw out the good ones with the bad because uh, you, you can have, you can have all kinds of issues that way. You can be thrown away. You know, you, you might say, well, I'm going to throw away all these loads because they just don't have the, the great uh, numbers. The, the paper will tell the tale. Um, so this, let's see, this load here, I've got shots to go from the middle of the target and they work their way up. 
Um, this is, there's, there's two possibilities for this. If you've got a bedded barrel, if, you're, if your barrel is bedded to the stock, that can do that. In other words, older rifles that had uh, that pillow bedding block out at the front, uh, as, the, as the barrel heat built up, uh, the barrel, you know, metal expands when it gets hot. And as the, as the barrel gets bigger in diameter, and it doesn't have to be by much, it only has to be thousandths of an inch, more pressure on that wood, uh, and the wood itself getting hotter, and the wood will expand as well, uh, that will cause the shots to rise on the paper. But if you have a rifle which has, you know, a good bedding system and the rifle is uh, free-floated, uh, this is caused by mirage, and this is caused by you. Uh, the mirage doesn't cause this. Uh, you, your inability to understand what, what the mirage is doing is causing it. Um, Understand that mirage is the refraction of an image uh, in in the air. In other words, in, in moisture. So the same as uh, when you look when you look at a, a a rock, you're looking into a river and you're looking at a rock. You go to you go to touch that rock with the end of your fishing pole or something, and it's not where you think it is. It's it's in a different place because the the refraction, the light coming down through the water, bends the bends the light rays and it puts it puts the image in a different position than where it actually is, and that occurs you know on a on a long long highway. You see a you see a big tractor trailer rig coming towards you from two miles away on a long highway, and on a hot day you may see that it looks like that entire that entire rig, uh, you know, is, is up in the air and it's coming toward you. And as it finally, as it gets closer toward you, it, it descends down onto the pavement. And that's because of the light refraction that occurs. And that's what occurs with mirage on a target. So because, you, because you're not able to read that mirage, you're not noticing that the target tends to be doing this as you're looking through the scope. Or maybe it gets there and it just, it just hangs and then it drops and it hangs and drops. That's because maybe a little breeze is coming in and all of a sudden when the breeze comes in it blows that it blows the, those heat waves away and all of a sudden it drops. That's where the target is. It's not up here. It's down here. And as the as the barrel tends to get hotter and as more heat comes out of the end of the barrel, that's where most of the heat comes. It's not it's not off the barrel. Most of the heat comes out of the end of the barrel. That's your visible that's your visible stream of air that uh, is causing uh, mirage. As that's coming out, that is causing that is causing your target to appear higher and higher and higher, and you keep adjusting yourself higher and higher and higher. So people who are shooting machine rests, you know, people who are shooting with with guns clamped into a machine rest, and all they're doing is pull, pulling the trigger, you know, cycling the action, pulling the trigger. They don't have this issue because they're not they're not trying to read mirage. They're, they're just they're just sending bullets down range in exactly the same place because their their rifle is bolted to the bench, so that's 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 a visual issue. So on a on a mirage day, uh, and you know in, I would say that throughout throughout the year, more there are more mirage days than there are without mirage. Uh, you know it occurs even in the winter time, especially when you have a, a hot a, a heated barrel, um, but. Uh, Understand that and watch for it. And when you when you see that mirage, you know, expect it on a hot, humid day. You if 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 it's a hot, humid day, you absolutely have mirage. So if you if you have a if you have shots stringing upward on the paper, and they could be going zigzag because your rifle might be a you might have a one MOA rifle, so it could be a it could be a, a one inch wide dispersion laterally but vertically it's much much more pronounced so watch for that and and be very sure that you know you you placing your cross here at the bottom where the where the target tends to settle where it wants to every now and then where it wants to drop and on a breezy day uh, any bench rest shooter knows this on a breezy day he's got some difficult he's got some difficulties he's got to watch not only for mirage going up and down he's also got to watch for traveling a little bit to, to one side and mirage can be so severe where the target actually tends to disappear. It vanishes maybe for a, for an instant, and it's very it's very very tricky. Uh, but that's what that's what mirage is. Um, there is uh, like I say, you can have you can have this 
situation with older, older rifles or rifles which have uh, some sort of impingement of the barrel, uh, military rifles and things like that because, you know, the, the stocks can sometimes uh, cause that, uh, cause that uh, cramping of the, of the barrel. Well, here's one. We've got, maybe you've got a uh, one or one and a half MOA uh, group. You've got maybe, a, maybe even a two MOA group, but it's, 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 it's well organized uh, in the middle, but you have one blooper that goes out the side here. You've got a flyer that goes out the side. Don't discount, don't discount that group. If you're, if you're shooting incre incremental tests, and you're testing loads, don't, don't throw this group away because your overall group size might be uh, three or four inches. Uh, that could be simply a gust of wind that snuck in on you and uh, you didn't know about it and, and threw that shot wide. All you need to have, even on a calm day, all you have to have down someplace downrange is to have one, one gust of wind, uh, say eight or ten miles an hour, and it'll blow that, it'll blow that bullet off course and it will, it'll give you a misreading. It'll tell you that uh, you could oftentimes you could have simply uh, maybe a, a bad load creeped in or something, but that's that's a load which would be generally good. I'd give that another try, and uh, here's one here. This is a fairly large group. It's not it's it's not a uh, it's not a close tight group. It's maybe two or three MOA, uh, but everything other than that, it's a rounded group. It's uh, well organized, but it's just a large group. It just means that you've got the wrong powder. Uh, probably probably try a different try a different lot of powder. Um, I should say a different different brand of powder, different uh, number, because you, you, you're probably not going to you're probably not going to be finding a load uh, which gives you satisfactory results with that powder. If you've, if you've tried incremental tests, and the best you can do is that, that's just a bad powder, try a different powder. Okay, here's, here's one here. You've got, you got uh, three shots in one place and you've got two in another. Um, again, this is probably shooter error more than anything else or change in conditions. Uh, you, you know, you fired, fired these first ones down here, you're, you're testing some loads, you fired some, the first ones down here, and uh, everything was fine, and all of a sudden uh, they went up here. That might be because you didn't notice that the mirage was coming in on you, and you know, the wind was also starting to blow off to one side. This is a pretty organized set of groups here. You've got, you've got two groups which are quite organized, but that's that's typically uh, shooter error. That's the when I say shooter error, I'm I'm also including your inability to read the conditions. In other words, that's why when when people are you know doing uh, bench rest shooting these days, they'll put they'll put flags down range and they'll put wind vanes and flags down range ribbons so that they can see exactly what the wind is talking down along all the way down range because it's not just it's not just back where you are um, it's absolutely worthless to just get a little anemometer and just hold it up where your shooting bench is because that means absolutely nothing it's there's wind currents that are all the way down toward the target and you can have you can have contrary wind currents you can have wind currents which are blowing uh, three to nine in one in one spot and they can be blowing exactly in the opposite direction down range uh, so uh, you know, you've got to, if, if you're really serious about it, you've got to put wind flags, wind vanes down range and watch them with your scope. The most important thing is, <coughs> is that they're all uniform. In other words, that they're always the same. So if you've got a, if you've got a, a, a wind vane that's turning and they all orient themselves, say, at, at two o'clock and watch the ribbons, if the ribbons are all hanging out in space at 30 degrees, that's when to shoot. And then next time, make sure that the wind vanes play, uh, facing in the same direction with the, the, the uh, ribbons. Uh, a lot of bench rest shooters will just fire 
repeatedly until the, the conditions change. So they might, they might pop off two or three shots in rapid succession. When I say rapid succession, you know, within maybe three shots in 15 or 20 seconds, but they want to catch that one condition and then they'll wait for the same thing to occur again and then they'll fire off another two or three shots. So that's what that is. That's, a, that's basically, it's a change in, in conditions. That's not a, that's not a, that's not a bad rifle group because rifle groups don't, rifle groups don't occur uh, with that consistency in two different locations where you get three and two. So watch for that. And here's another one where you've got, you know, you're, you're on the, you're on the paper. You've got, you've got, uh, but it's a large group. You got say a two and a half or three inch, two and a half or three inch group. It may simply be your, it may simply be the limits of your rifle. If you're shooting a, uh, you know, model 94 Winchester or something like that, or a 336, uh, Marlin, uh, that at 100 yards, that may simply be the limitation of your rifle. But that's a superb group. It's a it's a it's a very organized group, uh, and they're they're all in one general location. It's just that they're they're a larger group. If you're shooting a rifle which is capable of greater accuracy than that, you you it's time to search for a different powder and try something else. So that's all I have to talk about today. Um, I wish I could get out and do some shooting with you. I, I, I've, got, I've got that whole test batch of uh, 45 ACP to um, test with the uh, Gold Cup National Match. It's been sitting and sitting and sitting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And I, can't, I can't do anything about it because so, so often when I, you know, it's nice and sunny out and I've got work I've got to do. Uh, and, or, or it's a sunny day and it's, and it's windy out and I can't do it. Um, or it's uh, it, like today, it's, it's very dull. All this morning has been dark and dull with thick overcast. And that's no good because, you know, your, your pupils dilate on a day like today. And when anybody who's into phot photography knows that, you know, when you stop open your lens and your, the iris on your lens is stopped open, you get no depth of field whatsoever. So, you know, you can take a picture of, you can take a picture of a flower here and, you know, the grass behind it, uh, only two feet away, is not in focus because there's absolutely no depth of field. And that's not a good time to shoot iron sights because iron sights, you need to have sharp iron sights and you need to have, you, you need to see where your target is. So, uh, it's important to have, um, it's important to have a good day where you have uh, wide open, wide open uh, aperture on your eyes so that you get that uh, strong depth of field. Um, so that's all there is to it. So thanks for watching. Did I say that backward? Did I talk about, <laughs> did I talk about dilating? It's, it's, it's exactly what I probably said wrong. When, you're, when your pupil is dilated, when, when you have a, a, a dull day, when you have a dull day and your pupils are dilated, you get no depth of field. When they're constricted and it's a bright sunny day, that's when you have the, the greatest depth of field. So there it is. So <laughs> thank you, Patreon donors, for all your help. Uh, everything that you've been donating uh, helps, helps me out. Uh, parts for whatever I need to get to uh, bring uh, information to you. Um, I mean, even something like this. I mean, I, you know, I, I burn up a bunch of, I burn up a bunch of ink on my printer, so that'll, that'll help me get some, uh, get some printer ink for that. So uh, it all goes to help. So thanks for your assistance. And, uh, if you can't give me a thumbs up, please give me a thumbs up and, um, hit the bell and subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Thanks for watching. God bless.